tonight's lecture is over the theory of evolution. Charles Darwin was born in 1809 on the same day as Abraham Lincoln. Even as a boy, Darwin's consuming interest in nature was evident. When he was not reading nature books, he was in the fields and forests, fishing, hunting, and collecting insects. His father, an eminent physician, could see no future for a naturalist and sent Charles to the University of Edinburgh to study medicine. But Charles, who was only 16 years old at the time, found medical school boring and distasteful. He left Edinburgh without a degree and then enrolled at Christ College at Cambridge University, intending to become a minister. Darwin received his B.A. degree, which included courses in biology, in 1831. Soon after, his botany professor recommended him to Captain Robert Fitzroy, who was preparing the survey ship the HMS Beagle for a voyage around the world. It was a tour that would have a profound effect on Darwin's thinking and eventually on the thinking of the entire world. Darwin was 22 years old when he sailed from Great Britain on the Beagle in December of 1831. The main mission of the voyage was to chart poorly known stretches of the South American coastline. Darwin spent most of his time on shore collecting thousands of specimens of fossils and living plants and animals. He noted the unique adaptations of organisms that inhabited such diverse environments as the Brazilian jungles, the grasslands of the Argentine pampas, and the desolate and frigid lands of the southern tip of South America. In spite of their unique adaptations, the plants and animals throughout the continent all had a definite South American stamp, very distinct from the life forms of Europe. That in itself may not have surprised Darwin, but the plants and animals living in the temperate regions of South America seemed more closely related to the species living in the tropical regions of that continent than to the species living in the temperate regions of Europe. And the South American fossils Darwin found, though clearly different species from living ones, were distinctly South American in their resemblance to the living plants and animals of that continent. These observations led Darwin to wonder if contemporary South American species owed their features to descent from ancestral species on that continent. Darwin was particularly intrigued by the geographic distribution of organisms on the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are relatively young volcanic islands about 900 kilometers, that's about 540 miles, off the Pacific coast of South America. Most of the animals that inhabit these remote islands are found nowhere else in the world, but they resemble species living on the South American mainland. While on his voyage, Darwin was strongly influenced by the newly published Principles of Geology by Scottish geologist Charles Lyell. The book presented the case for an ancient earth sculpted by gradual geological processes that continue today. Having witnessed an earthquake that raised part of the coastline of Chile almost a meter, Darwin realized the natural forces gradually changed the Earth's surface and that these forces still operate. Thus, the growth of mountains as a result of earthquakes could account for the presence of marine snail fossils he collected on mountaintops in the Andes. Darwin would eventually apply this principle of gradualism to the evolution of Earth's life. By the time Darwin returned to Great Britain five years later after the Beagle set sail, a full three years longer than was originally planned, his experiences and reading had led him to seriously doubt that the Earth and all its living organisms had been specially created only a few thousand years earlier. Darwin had come to realize that the earth was very old and constantly changing. He began to analyze his collections and to discuss them with colleagues. He continued to read, correspond with other scientists, and maintain extensive journals on his observations, studies, and thoughts. On November 24, 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Darwin's book presented two main concepts. First, he argued convincingly from several lines of evidence that contemporary species arose from a succession of ancestors through a process of quote-unquote descent with modification. This is his phrase for evolution. 
Darwin's second concept in the origin of species was a mechanism for how life evolves, and that is natural selection. Natural selection is a process in which organisms with certain inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than are individuals with other traits. As a result of natural selection, a population, a group of individuals of the same species living in the same place at the same time, can change over generations. Moving on, natural selection leads to evolutionary adaptation, that is, a population's increase in the frequency of traits suited to the environment. The term adaptation can also refer to the trait itself. For example, an insect's camouflage is an adaptation that helps it avoid predators. In modern terms, we would say that the genetic composition of the population has changed over time, and that is one way of defining evolution. But we can also use the term evolution on a much grander scale to mean all of biological history, from the earliest microbe to the enormous diversity of organisms that live on the earth today. Darwin's book drew a cohesive picture of life by connecting the dots between a bewildering array of seemingly unrelated facts. The origin of species focused on biologists' attention on the great diversity of organisms, their origins and relationships, the similarities and differences, their geographic distribution, and their adaptations to the surrounding environments. Darwin identified three principles that lead to natural selection. One is that most characteristics of organisms are inherited or passed from parent to offspring. Even though genes and genetics were unknown at the time, this was a common understanding. Furthermore, Darwin said that more offspring are produced and are able to survive, so resources for survival and reproduction are limited. There is competition for those resources in each generation. The third principle states that offspring vary among each other in regard to their characteristics, and those variations are inherited. Moving on, before we examine how natural selection works and how Darwin derived the idea, let's place the Darwinian revolution in its historical context. The view of life developed in the origin of species sharply contrasts with the prevailing view during Darwin's lifetime. Many scientists of his day thought that the earth was relatively young and populated by a huge number of unrelated species. The origin of species challenged that widely held notion. It was truly radical for its time, not only challenging the current scientific views, but also shaking the deepest roots of Western culture. One of the prevalent ideas at the time was the idea of a fixed species. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, whose views had an enormous impact on Western culture, generally held that species are fixed or permanent and do not evolve. Judeo-Christian culture forfeited this idea with a literal interpretation of the biblical book of Genesis, which tells the story of each form of life being individually created in its present-day form. The idea that all living species are unchanging in form and inhabit an earth that is only about 6,000 years old dominated the intellectual climate of the Western world for centuries. There are people out there today who lump evolution in with atheism. I do not believe that that is the case. Remember Darwin, he studied to be a clergyman, and he was not an atheist. His theory was born out of scientific facts and observations. I believe the theory of evolution can actually support a creationist argument. If there is a God who is a grand engineer, would it not be reasonable for this grand engineer to engineer the ability to change into life and life cycles? If you look at the universe, there's really only two constants in it. That is mathematics and change. Darwin was not the only one who was questioning the belief system at this time in history. For instance, in the mid-1700s, the study of fossils, which are imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past, led French naturalist Georges Buffon to suggest that the Earth might be much older than 6,000 years old. He also observed similarities between particular fossils and living animals. In 1766, Buffon proposed that certain fossil forms might be ancient versions of similar living species. 
Then, in the early 1800s, French naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck suggested that the best explanation for this relationship of fossils to current organisms is that life evolves. Lamarck explained evolution as the refinement of traits that equip organisms to perform successfully in their environments. For example, some birds have powerful beaks that enable them to crack tough seeds. We remember Lamarck mainly for his erroneous view of how species evolve. He proposed that by using or not using its body parts, an individual may develop certain traits that it passes on to offspring. In other words, Lamarck proposed that acquired traits are inherited. He suggested, for example, that the strong beaks of seed-cracking birds are the cumulative result of ancestors exercising their beaks during feeding and passing that acquired beak power onto their offspring. However, simple observations provide evidence against the inheritance of acquired traits. For example, a carpenter who builds up strength and stamina through a lifetime of pounding nails with a heavy hammer will not pass enhanced biceps onto children. However, Lamarck's mistaken idea obscures the important fact that he helped set the stage for Darwin by proposing that species evolve as a result of interactions between organisms and their environments. By the early 1840s, Darwin had composed a long essay describing the major features of his theory of evolution. However, he realized that his ideas would be controversial and therefore delayed publishing his essay. Then, in the mid-1850s, Alfred Wallace, a British naturalist doing fieldwork in Indonesia, developed a theory almost identical to Darwin's. When Wallace sent Darwin a manuscript describing his own ideas on natural selection, Darwin wrote, quote unquote, All my originality will be smashed. However, in 1858, two of Darwin's colleagues presented Wallace's paper and excerpts from Darwin's earlier essay together to the scientific community. With the publication in 1859 of The Origin of Species, Darwin presented the world with an avalanche of evidence and a strong logical argument for evolution. As noted earlier, Darwin made two main points in The Origin of Species. First, he presented evidence that each living species descended from a succession of ancestral species. In the first edition of his book, he did not use the word evolution, referring instead to quote-unquote descent with modification. Moving on, remember, natural selection is a process in which organisms with certain inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than are individuals with other traits. So, natural selection can only take place if there is variation or differences among individuals in a population. This is key to understanding evolution, because evolution only occurs on a population-wide scale. Furthermore, genetic diversity in a population comes from two main mechanisms, that is mutation and sexual reproduction. Mutation, which is a change in DNA, is the ultimate source of new alleles or genetic variation in any population. Remember, we talked about that in a previous chapter. A mutation in hemoglobin can give rise to sickle cell. Sickle cell is more common among people of African descent and people who live in Africa. And carriers of the sickle cell trait are particularly resistant to severe malarial episodes. On a population-wide scale, this mutation seems like it was an important mechanism by which people who live in an area of the world where malaria is frequent can have a greater chance of surviving. Also, sexual reproduction leads to genetic diversity. We discussed this in a previous chapter, too. Remember when we discussed meiosis and how the crossing over of alleles can lead to great genetic diversity. So where asexual reproduction creates exact clones of the parent cell, Sexual reproduction uses combinations of alleles to produce the unique genotypes and thus phenotypes in each of the offspring. Moving on, Darwin hypothesized that as the descendants of the earliest organisms spread into various habitats over millions of years, they accumulated modifications or adaptations to diverse ways of life. 
Darwin also reasoned that natural selection is the mechanism for descent with modification. Basically, Darwin perceived adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species as closely related processes. Imagine, for example, that an animal species from a mainland colonizes a chain of distant, relatively isolated islands. In the Darwinian view, populations of the different islands may diverge more and more in appearance as each population adapts to its local environment. Over many generations, the populations on different islands could become dissimilar enough to be designated as separate species. For instance, the evolution of finches on the Galapagos Islands is an example. It is a reasonable hypothesis that the islands were colonized by finches that strayed from elsewhere and then diversified on the different islands. Among the differences between the Galapagos finches are their beaks, which are adapted to specific foods available on each species' home island. Darwin anticipated that explaining how such adaptations arise is key to understanding evolution. Sometimes evolution gives rise to groups of organisms that become tremendously different from each other. When two species evolve in diverse directions from a common point, it is called divergent evolution. On the other hand, convergent evolution occurs where similar traits evolve independently in species that do not share a recent common ancestry. Moving on, we will now examine five of the many lines of evidence in support of evolution. The fossil record is a historical record. Over millions of years, sand and silt that eroded from the land were carried by rivers and deposited in the oceans, piling up and compressing older deposits below into rock. Some dead organisms that settled along with the sediments left imprints in the rocks. Thus, each rock layer or stratum, plural strata, bears a unique set of fossils representing a local sampling of the organisms that lived and died when that sediment was deposited. Younger strata are on top of older ones, so the positions of fossils in the strata reveal their relative age. The ages of fossil can also be confirmed using radiometric dating. The fossil record is this ordered sequence of fossils as they appear in the rock layers, marking the passage of geologic time. The fossil record reveals the appearance of organisms in a historical sequence. The oldest known fossils, dating from about 3.5 billion years ago, are prokaryotes. This fossil evidence fits with the molecular and cellular evidence that prokaryotes are the ancestors of all life. Fossils in the younger layers of rock reveal the evolution of various groups of eukaryotic organisms. Paleontologists, who are scientists that study fossils, have discovered many transitional forms that linked past and present. For example, a series of translational fossils provides evidence that birds descended from one branch of dinosaurs. Another example is a series of transitional whale fossils connecting these aquatic mammals to four-legged land mammals. Whales living today have four legs in the form of flippers and small bones that may be remnants of ancestral hind legs and feet. In the past few decades, a series of remarkable fossils of extinct mammals have been discovered in Pakistan, Egypt, and North America that document the transition from life on land to life in the sea. Some whale ancestors had the type of ankle bone that is otherwise unique to the group of land mammals that includes pigs, hippos, cows, camels, and deer. The ankle bone similarly strongly suggests that whales, as well as dolphins and porpoises, are most closely related to this group of land mammals. The comparison of body structures in different species is called comparative anatomy. Certain anatomical similarities among species are signs of evolutionary history. For example, the same skeletal elements make up the forelimbs of humans, cats, whales, and bats, even though the functions of these forelimbs differ greatly. 
Clearly, a whale's flipper does not do the same job as a bat's wing. If these limbs had been uniquely engineered in their current forms, we would expect a variety of basic designs that reflect their unique tasks. It is more probable that the arms, forelegs, flippers, and wings of these different mammals are variations on anatomical structures of an ancestral organism, structures that over millions of years have become adapted to different functions. These adaptations account for the observed similarities in structures despite different uses. Such similarity in structure due to common ancestry is called homology. The forelimbs of diverse mammals are therefore known as homologous structures. Comparative anatomy attests that evolution is a remodeling process in which ancestral structures become modified as they take on new functions, the kind of process that Darwin referred to as descent with modification. The historical constraints of this modification are evident in anatomical imperfections. For example, the human spine and knee joint were derived from ancestral structures that supported four-legged mammals. Consequently, almost none of us will reach old age without experiencing knee or back problems. If these structures had first taken form specifically to support our bipedal posture, we would expect them to be less subject to sprains, spasms, and other common injuries. Some of the most interesting homologous structures are quote-unquote leftover structures of marginal, if any, importance to the organism. These vestigial structures are remnants of features that served important functions in the organism's ancestors, such as the rear leg bones evident in ancient whale fossils. In another example, the skeletons of some snakes retain vestiges of the pelvis and leg bones of walking ancestors. If limbs were a hindrance to ancient snakes' way of life, natural selection would favor snake descendants with successively smaller limbs. Comparing early stages of development in different animal species reveals additional homologies not visible in adult organisms. This is called comparative embryology. For example, all vertebrate embryos have a developmental stage in which structures called pharyngeal pouches appear on the sides of the throat. At this stage, the embryos of fishes, frogs, snakes, birds, and apes, indeed all vertebrates, look more alike than different. The different classes of vertebrates take on more distinct features as development progresses. For example, pharyngeal pouches develop into gills in fishes, but into parts of the ear and throat in humans. Moving on, it was the geographic distribution of species called biogeography that first suggested to Darwin that today's organisms evolved from ancestral forms. Consider, for example, Darwin's visit to the Galapagos Islands. Darwin noted that the Galapagos animals resembled species of the South American mainland more than they resembled animals on similar but distant islands. The logical explanation was that the Galapagos species evolved from animals that had migrated from South America, each species adapting to its new environment. Many other examples of biogeography seem baffling without an evolutionary perspective, such as the diversity of marsupials in Australia. Why is Australia home to so many kinds of marsupials, that is, mammals that complete embryonic development outside of the uterus, typically in a mother's pouch, but relatively few placental mammals, that is, mammals that complete embryonic development in the uterus? It is not because Australia is inhospitable to placental mammals. Humans have introduced rabbits, foxes, and many other placental animals to Australia, where these introduced species have thrived to the point of becoming ecological and economic nuisances. The prevailing hypothesis is that the unique Australian wildlife evolved on that island continent in isolation from regions where early placental mammals diversified. The geographic distribution of species makes little sense if we imagine that species were individually placed in suitable environments. In the Darwinian view, we find species where they are because they evolved from ancestors that inhabited those regions.
The heredity background of an organism is documented in its DNA and in the proteins encoded by the DNA. If two species have genes with nucleotide sequences that match closely, and thus proteins with amino acid sequences that match closely, biologists conclude that these sequences are homologous and must have been inherited from a relatively recent common ancestor. In contrast, the greater the number of sequence differences between species, the less likely they share a close common ancestor. Molecular comparisons between diverse organisms have allowed biologists to develop hypotheses about the evolutionary divergence of branches on the tree of life. For example, genetic analyses first suggested that the domain archaea is more closely related to eukaryotes than it is to the domain bacteria. Darwin's boldest hypothesis was that all forms of life are related to some extent through the branching of evolution from the earliest organisms. About 100 years after Darwin made his claim, molecular biology began providing strong evidence for evolution. All forms of life use the same genetic language of DNA and RNA and the genetic code, that is, how RNA triplets are translated into amino acids, and this is nearly universal. The genetic language has been passed along through all branches of evolution since its beginnings in an early form of life. We will now discuss some misconceptions about evolution. One is that evolution is just a theory. A scientific theory is understood to be a body of thoroughly tested and verified explanations for a set of observations of the natural world. A quote-unquote theory, in common vernacular, is a word meaning a guess or suggested explanation. This meaning is more akin to the scientific concept of hypothesis. Also, individuals evolve. Well, I was discussing this one briefly on a previous slide, that what you have to understand about evolution is that evolution occurs on a population-wide scale. This takes us back to chapter 1. Remember in chapter 1 we discussed how life is organized, and one of the levels of organization of life is the population. So evolution is the change in genetic composition of a population over time, specifically over generations. And this results from differential reproduction of individuals with certain alleles. Moving on, organisms evolve on purpose. So a changed environment results in some individuals in the population, that is, those with particular phenotypes, benefiting and therefore producing proportionately more offspring than other phenotypes. Species do not become quote-unquote better over time. They simply track their changing environment with adaptations that maximize their reproduction in a particular environment at a particular time. Another misconception is that evolution explains the origin of life. The theory of evolution does not try to explain the origin of life. Evolution does not shed light on the beginnings of life, including the origins of the first cells, which is how life is defined. Moving on, natural selection requires heredity processes that Darwin could not explain. How do the variations that are the raw material for natural selection arise in a population? And... How are these variations passed along from parents to offspring? Darwin and Gregor Mendel lived and worked at the same time. In fact, by breeding peas in his abbey garden, Mendel illuminated the very hereditary processes required for natural selection to work. However, Mendel's discoveries were unappreciated by the scientific community during his lifetime. Mendelism and Darwinism finally came together in the mid-1900s, decades after both scientists had died. The fusion of genetics with evolutionary biology came to be known as the modern synthesis. One of its key elements is an emphasis on the biology of populations. As stated earlier, evolution can be measured as changes in the genetic composition of a population over time. It helps, as a basis of comparison, to know what to expect if a population is not evolving. A non-evolving population is in genetic equilibrium, which is also known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The population's gene pool remains constant. From generation to generation, 
the frequencies of alleles, say P and Q, for instance, and genotypes, say P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared, are unchanged. Sexual shuffling of genes cannot by itself change a large gene pool. One of the products of the modern synthesis was a definition of evolution that is based on the genetics of populations. Evolution is a generation-to-generation -generation change in a population's frequencies of alleles. Because this evolution is viewed on the smallest scale, it is sometimes referred to as microevolution. Microevolution is sometimes contrasted with macroevolution, that is, evolution that involves large changes such as formation of new groups or species, and this happens over long periods of time. Most biologists view microevolution and macroevolution as the same process, but it just happens on different time scales. Moving on, a gene pool consists of all the alleles in a population at any one time. The gene pool is the reservoir from which the next generation of organisms draws its genes. Imagine a wildflower population with two varieties contrasting in flower color. An allele for purple flowers, which we will symbolize capital W, is the dominant to an allele for white flowers, symbolized by lowercase w. Remember, an allele is a version of a gene, a heritable unit that controls a particular feature of an organism, and allele frequency refers to how frequently a particular allele appears in a population. It's also possible to calculate genotype frequencies, that is the fraction of individuals with a given genotype, and phenotype frequencies, that is the fraction of individuals with a given phenotype. The equation on the right-hand side of your slide shows how to calculate the frequency of an allele. To calculate the allele frequency, divide the number of copies of any given allele in a population by the total number of alleles in the population. Moving on, natural selection only acts on the population's heritable traits. Selecting for beneficial alleles and thus increasing their frequency in the population while selecting against deleterious alleles and thereby decreasing their frequency in the population. This is a process known as adaptive evolution. Natural selection also acts at the level of the individual. It selects for individuals with greater contributions to the gene pool of the next generation known as an organism's evolutionary or Darwinian fitness. However, it is not the absolute fitness of an individual that counts, but rather how it compares to the other organisms in the population, and this is what we call relative fitness. The phrases, quote-unquote, struggle for existence and, quote-unquote, survival of the fittest are misleading if we take them to mean direct competitive contests between individuals. These are animal species in which individuals lock horns or otherwise fight one another to determine mating privilege. But reproductive success is generally more subtle and passive. Plants in a wildflower population, for example, may differ in their reproductive success because some attract more pollinators, perhaps the result of slight differences in flower color, shape, or fragrance. For instance, a frog may produce more eggs than her neighbors because she is better at catching insects for food. These examples point to a biological definition of fitness. That is, the contribution an individual makes to the gene pool of the next generation relative to the contributions of other individuals. Thus, the fittest individuals in the context of evolution are those that produce the largest numbers of viable, fertile offspring and thus pass on the most genes to the next generation. Moving on, stabilizing selection favors intermediate phenotypes. It typically occurs in relatively stable environments where conditions tend to reduce physical variation. This evolutionary conservatism works by selecting against the more extreme phenotypes. For example, 
Stabilizing selection keeps the majority of human birth weights between 3 and 4 kilograms, or approximately 6.5 to 9 pounds. For babies much lighter or heavier than this, infant mortality is greater. Directional selection shifts the overall makeup of a population by selecting in favor of one extreme phenotype. Directional selection is most common when the local environment changes or when organisms migrate to a new environment. An actual example is the shift of insect populations towards a greater frequency of pesticide-resistant individuals. Diversifying selection, which is also sometimes known as disruptive selection, can lead to a balance between two or more contrasting phenotypes in a population. A patchy environment, which favors different phenotypes in different patches, is one situation associated with disruptive selection. Darwin was the first to explore the implications of sexual selection, that is a form of natural selection in which individuals with certain traits are more likely than other individuals to obtain mates. The males and females of an animal species obviously have different reproductive organs. But they may also have secondary sexual traits, that is, noticeable differences not directly associated with reproduction or survival. This distinction in appearance, called sexual dimorphism, is often manifested in a size difference. Among male vertebrates, sexual dimorphism may also be evident in adornment, such as manes on lions, antlers on deer, or colorful plumage on peacocks and other birds. In some species, secondary sex structures may be used to compete with members of the same sex for mates. This occurs more often in males than in females. Contests may involve physical combat, but are more often ritualized displays. Such selection is common in species where the winning individual acquires a harem of mates, an obvious boost to that male's evolutionary fitness. In a more common type of sexual selection, individuals of one sex, usually females, are choosy in selecting their mates. Males with the largest or most colorful adornments are often the most attractive to females. The extraordinary feathers of a peacock's tail are an example of this sort of quote-unquote choose-me statement. Every time a female chooses a mate based on a certain appearance or behavior, she perpetuates the alleles that caused her to make that choice and allows a male with that particular phenotype to perpetuate his alleles. What is the advantage to females of being choosy? One hypothesis is that females prefer male traits that are correlated with quote-unquote good genes. In several bird species, research has shown that traits preferred by females, such as bright beaks or long tails, are related to overall male health. But I think that it's also relevant to point out here that the sex of the individual who contributes the most to reproduction is usually in that case the most choosy when it comes to who they reproduce with. For example, in humans, the female has the most investment in reproduction. She carries the offspring to term. She nurses the baby after it's born. She has a larger investment in the outcome than the male does, so therefore she is more choosy about her mate. In the praying mantis species, however, the female will kill the male after reproduction. So that male has a greater investment in reproduction than the female does. And in this case, he will be more selective about his mate. And this next slide just gives us some visuals on the types of selection that we've been talking about. At letter A, robins typically lay four eggs, and this is an example of stabilizing selection. Larger clutches may result in malnourished chicks, where smaller clutches may result in no viable offspring. At letter B, we see that light-colored peppered moths are better camouflaged against a pristine environment. Likewise, dark-colored peppered moths are better camouflaged against a sooty environment. 
Thus, as the Industrial Revolution progressed in 19th century England, the color of the moth population shifted from light to dark. This is an example of directional selection. And letter C shows us an example of diversifying selection or disruptive selection. So in a hypothetical population of gray and Himalayan rabbits, some rabbits are better able to blend with rocky environments than other rabbits. And moving on to the next slide, we see some visuals of sexual dimorphisms. We mentioned sexual dimorphisms on a previous slide, but you can see how the peacocks, male and female, look different. The males have the tail feathers, and you can see the size difference in the spiders. And in letter C, where we see the ducks, you can see that the male has the more bright colors on his feathers. Moving on, heritability tells us how much phenotypic variation in a population is ultimately due to genetic differences as opposed to acquired differences. The diversity of alleles and genotypes within a population is called genetic variance. Allele and genotypic frequencies can change due to natural selection. We've talked extensively about natural selection this lecture. Genetic drift is another mechanism of evolution. Let's say you flip a coin 1,000 times, and a result of 700 heads and 300 tails would make you very suspicious about that coin. But flip a coin 10 times, and an outcome of 7 heads and 3 tails would seem within reason. With a smaller sample, there is a greater chance of deviation from an idealized result, in this case, an equal number of heads and tails. So let's apply this coin toss logic to a population's gene pool. If a new generation draws its alleles at random from the previous generation, then the larger population, the sample size, the better the new generation will represent the gene pool of the previous generation. Thus, one requirement for a gene pool to maintain the status quo is a large population size. The gene pool of a small population may not be accurately represented in the next generation because of a sampling error. The changed gene pool is analogous to the erratic outcome from a small sample of coin tosses. Chance causes the frequencies of the alleles to change over the generations, and that fits our definition of microevolution. This evolutionary mechanism, a change in the gene pool of a population due to chance, is called genetic drift. But... What would cause a population to shrink down to a size where there is genetic drift? There are two ways that this can occur. One way is called the bottleneck effect, and the other way is called the founder effect. Disasters such as earthquakes, floods, and fires may kill large numbers of individuals producing a small surviving population that is unlikely to have the same genetic makeup as the original population. By chance, Certain alleles may be overrepresented among the survivors, other alleles may be underrepresented, and some alleles may be eliminated. Chance may continue to change the gene pool for many generations until the population is again large enough for sampling errors to be significant. And the cartoon on your slide with the bottle and the cup and the balls illustrates why genetic drift due to a drastic reduction in population size is called the bottleneck effect. Bottlenecking usually reduces the overall genetic variability in a population because at least some alleles are likely to be lost from the gene pool. An important application of this concept is the potential loss of individual variation and hence adaptability in bottleneck populations of endangered species such as the cheetah. The fastest of all running animals, cheetahs are magnificent cats that were once widespread in Africa and Asia. Like many African mammals, the number of cheetahs fell drastically during the last ice age, and that was around 10,000 years ago. At that time, the species suffered a severe bottleneck, possibly as a result of disease, human hunting, and periodic droughts. Evidence suggests that the South African cheetah population suffered a second bottleneck during the 1800s when farmers hunted the animals to near extinction. Today, only a few small populations of cheetahs exist in the wild. 
genetic variability in these populations is very low compared with populations of other mammals. This lack of variability, coupled with an increasing loss of habitat, makes the cheetah's future precarious. The cheetahs remaining in Africa are being crowded into nature preserves and parks as human demands on the land increase. Along with crowding comes an increased potential for the spread of disease. With so little variability, the cheetah has a reduced capacity to adapt to such environmental challenges. Captive breeding programs are already underway and may be required for the cheetah's long-term survival. Genetic drift is also likely when a few individuals colonize an isolated island, lake, or other new habitat. The smaller the colony, the less its genetic makeup will match the gene pool of the larger population from which the colonists immigrated. If the colony succeeds, random drift will continue to affect the frequency of alleles until the population is large enough for genetic drift to be minimal. The type of genetic drift resulting from the establishment of a small new population whose gene pool differs from that of the parent population is called the founder effect. The founder effect undoubtedly contributed to the evolutionary divergence of finches and other organisms that arrived as strays on the remote Galapagos Islands that Darwin visited. The founder effect also explains the relatively high frequency of certain inherited disorders in some small human populations. For instance, in 1814, a group of 15 people founded a British colony on Tristan de Cunha, a cluster of small islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Apparently, one of the colonists carried a recessive allele for retinitis pigmentosa, a progressive form of blindness. Of the 240 descendants who still lived on the island in the 1960s, four had retinitis pigmentosa and nine others were heterozygous carriers with one copy of the recessive allele. The frequency of the retinitis pigmentosa allele was 10 times higher on Tristan de Cunha than in the British population from which the founders came. Another source of evolutionary change separate from genetic drift is gene flow, where a population may gain or lose alleles when fertile individuals move into or out of the populations or when gametes, such as plant pollen, are transferred between populations. Gene flow tends to reduce differences between populations. For example, because humans today move more freely about the world than in the past, gene flow has become an important agent of evolutionary change in previously isolated human populations. Moving on, systematics is a discipline of biology that focuses on classifying organisms and determining their evolutionary relationships. Systematics include taxonomy, which is the identification, naming, and classification of species. Assigning scientific names to species is an essential part of systematics. Common names such as monkey, fly, and pea may work well in everyday communication, but they can be ambiguous because there are many species of each of these organisms. And... Some common names are misleading. For example, considering the following so-called fishes, jellyfish, which is an idarian, crayfish, which is a crustacean, and silverfish is an insect. Using an agreed-upon formal naming system eases communication among scientists, allows researchers to unambiguously identify an organism, and it makes it easier to recognize when a new species is discovered. The formal taxonomic system used by biologists today dates back to Carlos Linnaeus, who was a Swedish physician and botanist who lived from 1707 to 1778. He specialized in plants. Linnaeus's system has two main characteristics, a two-part name for each species and a hierarchical classification of species into a broader group of organisms. Linnaeus's system assigns to each species a two-part Latinized name or binomial. The first part of the binomial is a genus, plural genera, to which the species belongs. The second part of a binomial is unique for each species within the genus. 
the two parts must be used together to name the species. For example, the scientific name for the Honduras rosewood tree is Dalbergia stevensoni. In binomial nomenclature, the first word, the genus, is always capitalized, and the second word, the species, is never capitalized. And in its binomial context, it is italicized and Latinized. Moving on, ever since Darwin, systematics has had a goal beyond simple organization, that is, to have classification reflect evolutionary relationships. In other words, how an organism is named and classified should reflect its place within the evolutionary tree of life. Biologists use a phylogenetic tree to depict hypotheses about the evolutionary history of species. These branching diagrams reflect the hierarchical classification of groups nested within the more inclusive groups. And this next slide shows us a couple of different examples of phylogenetic trees. One we see is a rooted phylogenetic tree, and the other one is an unrooted phylogenetic tree. Moving on, a phylogenetic tree can be read like a road map of evolutionary history. Many phylogenetic trees have a single lineage at the base representing a common ancestor. This is an example of a rooted tree. In a rooted tree, the branching indicates evolutionary relationships. The point where a split occurs is called a branch point, and this represents where a single lineage evolved into a distinct new one. A lineage that evolved early from the root and remains unbranched is called a basal taxon. When two lineages stem from the same branch point, they are called sister taxa, and a branch with more than two lineages is called a polytomy. Unrooted trees, on the other hand, do not show a common ancestor, but do show relationships among species. However, there are some limits to phylogenetic trees. For instance, not all likeness is inherited from a common ancestor. Species from different evolutionary branches may have certain structures that are superficially similar if natural selection has shaped analogous adaptations. This is called convergent evolution. Similarity due to convergence is called analogy, not homology. For example, the wings of insects and those of birds are analogous flight equipment. They evolved independently and are built from entirely different structures. To develop phylogenetic trees and classify organisms according to evolutionary history, we must use only homologous similarities. This guideline is generally straightforward, but there can be complications. Adaptation can obscure homologies and convergence can create misleading similarities. I'd like to throw out another clue to distinguishing homology from analogy. The more complex two similar structures are, the less likely it is they evolved independently. For example, compare the skulls of a human and a chimpanzee. Although each is a fusion of many bones, they match almost perfectly, bone for bone. It is highly improbable that such complex structures matching in so many details could have separate origins. Most likely, the genes required to build these skulls were inherited from a common ancestor. So let's go ahead and quickly recap our lecture tonight. Why is Darwin considered the father of evolution? You should be able to answer that question now. Also, you should be able to list key ideas Darwin used as the basis for descent with modification. Furthermore, you should know how Darwin's work transformed into the theory of evolution. You should also be able to list the types of evidence that support the theory of evolution, both physical and biological. You should be able to detail some common misconceptions about evolution and why they are wrong. You should be able to describe how genetics and evolution are connected. You should be able to describe the environment and selective pressures that contribute to evolution. You should know the types of variation that can be found within a population. 
You should be able to explain the two main types of phylogenetic trees. You should know some of the limits of the phylogenetic trees. And you should be able to describe modern taxonomy and binomial nomenclatures. Mm -hmm. Thank you.